What is up guys, Lundic here and now I'm back with another Lundic Q&A, so another Q&A session, we've done this a few times, uh, you ask the questions, I'll give the answers, pretty simple, um, I'm just I'm glad I'm doing it now, I was going to do it earlier this week but I just didn't have time, so, but I'm doing it now, so that's good, so let's just get the questions really, and um, what have we got first, we got first, Waluigi deserves his own games, right, so here we go, right, I see a preface this guy, so, do you prefer a one-on-one -on -one match between Becky and Charlotte, Becky and Ronda in Bracket's original plans for the Survivor Series or WrestleMania 35 triple threat match with Charlotte? Right, so I've got a few questions on this vein like this. So I want to address everything about this topic in this question here. So if you ask a question about the WrestleMania 35 women's title situation, um, refer back to this question because I want to explain everything in here. So obviously now... It looks like what happened with Raw this way. It looks like it is indeed going to be a triple threat match for the Raw Women's Championship. So, to answer the question, um, yes, I would have much rather have had Becky versus Ronda Rousey 1-1. One one. I think most people would agree with that. That should have been the match. But, you know, they're putting Charlotte in there. And to me, that's all right. I mean, I'm not that upset about it. I mean, I think a lot of people on the IWC are raging about this. It's like... Jesus Christ, get a life. Um, so, obviously, this week, Unraw, they did the angle where Vince suspended Becky Lynch. And then, for 60 days, effectively putting her out of WrestleMania and replacing her with Charlotte Flair. Now, just for the uh, crack, boys. Becky's going to get back at the match. Don't worry about it. Storyline. It's a long-term storyline. There's, what, like six weeks, seven weeks between now and WrestleMania. Don't worry, guys. Becky's going to get in this match, and it's going to be a triple threat match. Um, yeah, it's fine. I mean, I don't have a, I don't, don't have a big problem with it. I mean, um, a lot of people are raging about it. I mean, oh my god, honestly, some of the reaction to this segment was absolutely ridiculous. I mean, I've seen people give it a zero out of ten. People raging, saying, "Oh, I'm done with WWE. WWE sucks." <clears throat> Number one, no, you're not. Number two. Just let the storyline play out. Um, I mean, it's fine. I mean, getting Charlotte in there. I mean, it's not like when Batista came back in 2014. I mean, at least Charlotte has worked hard as being a full-time performer. And one of the best performers in the women's division for the last several years. Then you've got Ronda Rousey, the big mainstream stars, come through MMA. Had one hell of a rookie year in WWE. Then you got Becky Lynch, the one who got over, um, the one who fought the way to this big spot. And um, this match is going to be awesome when it happens. I mean, I can't really wait for it. It should be. Hopefully, it will be the main event of WrestleMania. I'm pretty sure it will be. Um, I'm absolutely fine with this. I mean, I thought the segment on Raw was really good. I mean, the heat on Charlotte was unreal. And the promo she cut on SmackDown. Um, so, can we just address this right now? The Charlotte, Charlotte and Roman Reigns comparison to a stop right now. Um, big difference is <clears throat> Charlotte is clearly positioned as a heel. She was cutting a heel promo. She wants she the one to be is all right. The fans disliking it. It's not like Roman Reigns <coughs> or John Cena before that that was getting forced down our throat to the baby face. Fan, I mean, WWE knows full well fans don't like Charlotte. And WWE's going to play that up to the hilt. Um, so maybe it'll just make Becky Lynch all that more loved because of the baby face. Now she's got major obstacles. First, she has to get back into the WrestleMania match, which I believe she will. If I have to guess, she'll probably wrestle Charlotte at Fastlane and have to beat Charlotte to get a spot back into the match. Then at WrestleMania, she's got to overcome the, probably the most pushed woman in the division, the person who's been a rival all these years, Charlotte Flair, and the undefeated MMA fighter, Ronda Rousey. So when Becky Lynch does win, it's going to be a huge moment. But so, so honestly, guys, just calm people getting angry about Charlotte being inserted in this. Just calm the F down. Let the storyline play out. I mean, Jesus Christ. Some of the reactions I've seen is like, Really just get a life and just calm the fuck down. Stop taking this wrestling thing too. Bloody seriously, man. It's like, come on. Charlotte's, and Charlotte's great. Charlotte's awesome. Um, 
I mean, can anyone really argue that Charlotte's work isn't great? I mean, she's been awesome in the ring. I mean, sometimes the promos suck, I'll admit, but sometimes they're really, really good. And obviously, she's she's, she's worked hard, hasn't she, really? Um, but yes, overall, I would have absolutely... If it was up to me and me only, I would have much rather done Becky and Ronda in a singles match. But a triple threat match is fine. I'm not really that upset about it at all. Um, let's just see like, how the storyline goes. Because the storyline will be really, really awesome. And let's just see how things go over the next few weeks. Um, uh, who is the worst Raw Rumble winner for you? Um, I think the obvious choice has to be Big John Studd in 1989. He stands out for me. I mean, obviously the first Rumble was Hacksaw Jim Duggan. But... This, there wasn't any real main event guys in that Royal Rumble match. I mean, I think you had like JYD, the Ultimate Warrior, the One Man Gang was in that match. So, um, so Duggan really made sense then after that, for the most part. The Royal Rumble matches were, wins were usually good. Um, but the one that really stands out has been, what? Big John Stone in 1989. I mean, that just seems... Even looking back, it looks, it looks so incredibly random. I mean, look at the guys you had in that Rumble match. You had Hogan, you had Macho Man, you had Andre the Giant, you had Ted DiBiase, you had Jake Snake Roberts. Um, oh, <laughs> and the guy that wins this match, uh, both Akeem and Boss Man, and then Big John Studd wins it. I mean, because what's weird, like, um, Big John Studd, of course, was a big part of the WWF during the expansion. 84, 85, those years, um... And then he disappeared in 1986, and then late 88, early 89, he comes back as a babyface out of nowhere, um, and then randomly wins this Royal Rumble. And if this had led to a huge push for Big John Studd down the line, fine. But what the hell did he do after that? WrestleMania 5, he was a guest referee in, in the Andre Jake match, and then he pretty much left the ref forever later that year. But yeah, honestly, it just looks really, really strange. And then, um, who was the worst member of the WWE Hall of Fame for you? So, I'm not going to include the celebrity win because I think that's an entirely different thing. So, I'm really only going to go for active like wrestlers, managers, announcers, people who are actually active in the wrestling business. You know, so no celebrities. Although for the record, I might pick a celebrity that was the worst. I probably go with Drew Carey. So I'll say the worst WWE Hall of Famer. It's got to be one or two, hasn't it? I mean, the one everyone seems to go with is Coco Beware. And then I'll probably agree with that. He definitely deserves a mention for worst Hall of Famer. Not shitting on the guy, but what the hell did he actually do to be in the WWE Hall of Fame, you know? Um, it'd be kind of like someone like Zack Ryder going to the Hall of Fame in 10 years' time. Um, but another recent one for me, just Hill Billy Jim. I mean, really, I mean, by the way, if you keep, if you listen hard enough, if you just stop, put your ear out, listen hard enough, you might be, you might be able to still hear Hillbill Jim's Hall of Fame speech. Apparently, his Hall of Fame speech is still going on. But yeah, I mean, Hillbilly Jim, yeah, it was over, but it was a novelty gimmick. I mean, he wasn't a really a good wrestler. I mean, he wasn't really stand out in me at all. I mean, to me, it seems like to get in the Hall of Fame, you have to be, you have to have um, been around during one of the two boom periods, because it seems like they put him... Um, Anyone that was really in the WF for a period of time during the golden era of the 80s, and anyone who was really there during the Attitude Era. So, you know, he'll, I'm not, it's not shitting on Hill Billy Jim. I mean, I'm sure he was entertaining to certain people, but. And I think, and I believe he worked behind the scenes of the WWE for a long time as well, but Hall of Famer, really, I mean, you've got a lot of guys that aren't in the Hall of Fame, and Hill Billy Jim is in there. That's just. Yeah, that, that is really odd to me, to be honest. Um, um, last question for you. Um, ah, good one. Because no one liked R-Truth being number 30 in the Royal Rumble. Are you satisfied if Nia Jax take this spot in the match? Yeah. I mean, it was fine. I mean, it's not like Nia Jax came and won the Royal Rumble or anything. And um, it's not like women haven't been in the men's Royal Rumble before. I mean, China was in two. Beth Phoenix was in one. And Karma was in one as well. So, and to me, the intergender stuff, I mean... I think the best person to do in agenda stuff is is with Nia Jax because obvious thing is Nia Jax is probably bigger than most of the men. I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to fat shame or anything like that. So don't come at me SJWs. I'm just saying 
as a fact, Nia Jax is taller and heavier than quite a lot of the men. So, so if her to come in and start beating down some guys, it kind of makes sense. And I know a lot of people lost their shit when she eliminated Mustafa Ali, but let's be honest, she could just eliminate Mustafa Ali because she's weighs quite a lot more than them. And then, oh, she took a mean RKO though, so... Um, yeah, I mean, it was fine, it was entertaining, there was nothing really wrong with it. I mean, I had no problem with it, I thought it was actually pretty nice twist. Are you right? Who did want to see R-Truth get the number 30 spot? I mean, I know he had it because he won the Mixed Match Challenge, um, but... Yeah, exactly, exactly, that's the thing. It's not like she took it from, like, I don't know, someone someone who the fans really liked, like a Rey Mysterio or someone like that. She took it to the spot from R-Truth, so... Did anyone really give a shit, you know? Then we got a... Uh, Next set of questions, honour of Seti Arte. How often do you hear Assman jokes while the Billy and Chuck tag team are active? And the winner of Strangers Question of the Q&A goes to you. Um, I don't know, I can't really remember. It was like, what, 17 years ago now? I mean, I'll, I'll guess there was a lot of jokes going around there, but I don't really remember. I mean, it was a long time ago. I mean, I'm sure there was Assman jokes going around, but I don't really remember that much. Do you feel the she amount of brands, in brackets, Raw, SD, NXT, 205, NXT UK, make WWE the most varied products as it's ever been? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you just spoke from there. Look at all the brands. You've got, like, what, five brands now? And there'll probably be more in the future. So, yeah, absolutely. That's the thing now. Like, when I, when I, when I, my message to wrestling fans who uh, get pissed off with it uh, because Raw might suck or whatever. You don't have to watch it. There's enough wrestling out there that something else you like. If you don't like what you're watching on Raw Smackdown, watch NXT or check out 205 or watch NXT UK. I mean, there's different variants of WWE out there now that um, you don't really have to sit and watch shitty Raws if you don't want to. Um, and obviously now we live in a time where this sort of thing is possible because obviously two things. Um, they have their own network now, so... Um, so let's say they try to do this, what they're doing now, like 2002, 2003, or whatever. Um, it probably wouldn't have worked because obviously you've got these brands and you've got to try and get them all TV deals to the brands. And it's probably, it's not going to be, it's not, not really that easy to uh, just go and get a TV deal for a show like NHT UK, for example, or 205 Live. So obviously now we have got the network, you can, um, they can just come up with a brand idea now and just... They don't have to shop around on um, TV networks. They just put it on their own network now. Now, obviously, we're living in a uh, time where pretty much, pretty much everyone has the internet. I mean, I mean, you, I mean, I mean, I mean kids might not even comprehend it. Like, years ago, not everyone had the internet. And if they did, they could only have it on the computer. So there was no iPads or tablets or smartphones of internet technology or your PS... Wait... Your PlayStation certainly couldn't stream internet um, uh, and all that sort of shit. You didn't have um So, yeah, all that shit wasn't around then. So, obviously, with uh, ev- everyone having a everyone having an internet device nowadays, it's pretty easy for people to access the internet now. So, you can do this. It is great. I mean, it's pretty cool. So, I mean, it's, it has led to a lot of guys who would never, ever, ever... Get jobs in WWE, get an opportunity to WWE because you don't the guy doesn't have to be signed to go to the main roster, they could sign someone they could sign a random British guy or you work on the NXT UK brand, I mean. I believe I could be wrong about this, but I, I don't think I am. As far as she in numbers, the number of wrestlers under contract with WWE right now is higher than it's ever been. I don't know what the exact number is, but it's gotta be well over a hundred. Hundred Maybe even pushing 150 when you think of them, um, all the brands he got. So yeah, it's pretty cool. And I dare say more's coming. I mean, I've heard rumours about them, um, them wanting to do something like an NXT Japan. I mean, that could happen. I mean, I know they had trials in Germany last year, so they could be looking at a performance center in Germany as well. So it's pretty cool. I've got to, yeah, I've got to say. There we go. Then um, do you see uh, all elite wrestling ceiling being? At the same level of TNA in the late 2000s, it's really hard to answer that question because it's hard to really definitively answer that question until the promotion gets going. 
because for all the hype that AEW's got, at this precise moment in time, they have not run one show. They don't have a television deal. Um, they don't have a uh, licensing and stuff like that yet. So, but I, I, I do think they got a chance because I've heard um, Double or Nothing sold out already, which is like a seventeen thousand seat area. I mean, if I had to guess, and this is just me guessing, I don't like really know anything. I'd probably say they could probably be a bit better than TNA was at the prime. Because you look at TNA, even TNA when they were doing relatively well, like 08, 09, they weren't really, they weren't selling out big arenas like that. I mean, I think the pay-per-views, they went, I think they would get like five, 6,000 max. Um, pay-per-view buy rates weren't really much at all. Um, impact ratings were all right, but obviously like in the one ranges, so... Um, I would say, let's be honest, I'm just going to be saying right now, all leads not going to be competition for WWE. So people just need to just calm the hell down and get out, get out of their heads for now. I mean, could all elite wrestling be a great alternative? Yeah. Could it uh, be a nice place for other guys to make a good living? Yeah. But WWE's been around for decades. They're a truly global brand by now. And you've got um, so much money in the bank. I mean, all that. I mean, obviously, it's a... So I would say, I would say as a guess it could probably be a little bit higher than TNA was, but not quite like WCW was at the peak. But it's going to be interesting to see. I mean, this is going to be watching all the wrestling over the next couple of years is going to be one of the most interesting stories in wrestling, isn't it? Really. Um. So yeah, thanks for the question. Then we got next Sharmia. Then we got number one. So this is like a long-winded question. So I'll just read this question out and give my thoughts. Um. Yeah. I know you wouldn't agree with me, but what would you say if I told you I unironically find the Mrs. Ryan's rise to stardom more inspiring than Brian's rise to stardom? Many people see Brian as a great underdog. He didn't have the look to be the top guy. He didn't have the size. He didn't have much charisma, but he overcame that despite the company not wanting him and the crowd wanted him. That's how he became a big name. So, good points. With the Miz, I find it's even more story touching because, well... It block capital letters. Nobody wanted him. Uh, the creative team didn't care for him. Uh, the locker room didn't want him. That's absolutely true. I mean, there's a famous story about Chris Benoit kicking the Miz out of the locker room um, many years ago. Um, what have we got? And I know JBL, I think, bullied him a little bit as well. Um, what have we got? Uh, well, I don't know. Let's go back to it. Both hardcore and fas- casual fans thought he didn't have any... Didn't think he belonged at all in the business. Um, he didn't have the look to be a top guy. He barely had the size. And when it came to charisma, he felt like a complete loser. But he overcame that with pure talent, will and hard work. And despite nobody wanting him, he made people want him. And look at him now. There won't be a single fan who won't miss him if he released tomorrow. And that makes me way more inspired than Brian ever did. If Anyway, if I don't get it in my questions, what are your thoughts and everything I said? I mean, yeah, fair, fine. I mean, I'm, that makes a lot of sense to me. I mean, obviously for me personally, I, I like Brian's rights more than the Miz. Um, but yeah, you're right. Nobody did want the Miz. I mean, he, he didn't have the look. I mean, the, the only one thing I really disagree with is um, you kind of say he didn't have charisma. I mean, I think I disagree with that because I feel like even in those early years, that was pretty much the only thing he had going from the fact he could talk. Um, well, yeah, it's quite an amazing looking back, really. I mean, where the Miz became and where and where the Miz went. I mean, you look at 2006. Nobody thought this guy would make it. I mean, he looked like he'd be around for about a year or two, and he'd be gone and never seen for business again. As a matter of fact, um, so when him and John Morrison were the big tag team at the time, I think everyone, including me, thought, yeah, John Morrison will break out and become a top guy, and the Miz will probably just float around a little bit and leave. But then the complete opposite happened. It was the Miz that rose the main event stairs. The Miz that became a WWE champion. And the Miz who main event at WrestleMania. Um, but yeah, I, I agree. I mean, you've got good points there about the Miz. Um, the Miz is, I mean, it's a great story, isn't it, really? And the only problem, really, is um, the Miz sucks as a baby face. I mean, which is a shame. And I mean, that, that's a big difference. Um, Daniel Bryan was believable as a baby face where... The Miz is just so good as a heel, it's really a shame to have him as a babyface. I mean, you remember his babyface run back in like 12, 13, I think it was? That just wasn't very good because I think Miz is a classic character of a person you love to hate 
rather than the guy you want to get behind. No, that's just me anyway. Um, but yeah, I agree. I mean, the Miz has had a great rise to the top. There we go. Um, if you ever experienced the feel of not liking a wrestler and not knowing why, don't know why, but sometimes I just don't get behind certain wrestlers and I don't even have a reason. Happened to me so many times, but there's two major examples. Ziggler and Osprey. Ziggler, I can somewhat guess why, since I hated him when I was a little kid who thought wrestling was real. But I also hated Brian, and I eventually ended up liking him as I became mature. Um, but I still just don't get Ziggler. With Osprey, I find it even more bizarre because I'm a fairly big fan of Ricochet. But I just can't bring myself to like Osprey. The ex- ex- experiences. For the most part, no. I mean... The only one I can really think of, I seem to have an irrational dislike of the young books. I mean, it's one of those things. Like, I know they're good, and I know they, I know they have the, I know they have their entertainment, But actually, ugh, God, they just, they just annoy me. Do you know when like someone just annoys you? That's what I get a feel for the young books. Ugh, I just find them obnoxious and that, and I just don't really know why. I mean, another one I think, but then I started thinking. For a while, I had this thing with Kevin Nash. Where he was just a guy that I just didn't like. But then really later on I figured, yeah, it's probably because he's an obnoxious jerk who like thinks he's better than he is and tries tries to be clever. I'm clever because he reminds me of that do you know that dickhead in school who was a top guy who used to push people around and all that. But he was still acting like that in his forties, like, ugh. Um and one example I can say if a guy that I never like or dislike, and I've always just been kind of meh with, and I don't know why, um, it's Randy Orton. I mean, I've always respected Randy Orton, but I've just always been really, really indifferent to him. Never really liked Randy Orton, but I never really hated him. Just was kind of eh with him, to be honest with you. But for the most part, people I dislike, I know full well why. Um, but yeah, um... Ah, what is your biggest ah right? But what is your biggest dream tag match in re- current wrestling today? Mine is Sammy and Kyo versus DIY with no storylines and all four men as baby faces. They don't need storylines to tell a story from both of these teams of mirror aims. That, that, that's, that's a good one. Can't deny that. That is a really really good one. And for me though, I think the revival versus the young bucks. I mean, yeah, this match would be awesome. I mean, obviously I'm a massive revival fan. Love the revival, and obviously, you get. I mean, the, the young books are like pretty, pretty much the complete opposite of the revival. The revival, that old school, gritty tag team. Young books are the younger, high flying, flashier guys. Oh, that'd be an awesome tag match, though, wouldn't it? I mean, it would be pretty much uh, Arn and Tully versus, or the Minnesota Wrecking Crew versus the Rock and Roll Express. But a modern version of that, obviously, updated here. Uh, have more hype impact action and all that I mean but yeah obviously I think Sammy and Kevin versus um DIY would be awesome that'd be fucking great but um yeah I've got to go with um, the Young Bucks versus the Revival for that one and we got um so for some of your old Astro FM questions and your old favourite wrestler video oh, is that not there anymore did I take that down um, um, I learned that you're actually a pretty big fan of Sid. My question is, why? Does no one need to shout, but whatever. I mean, more power to you, but almost every one of your generation on the internet hates him. That's wrong. That's that's an ignorant and wrong statement, by the way, but whatever. Um, and I find that really bizarre. Maybe I just don't understand because I'm a fan of this business in 2010, but whatever. The guy was awesome. The guy was cool. That's the thing. I don't really care that much if someone's an awesome technical wrestler who can do all these wow look at all these spots this guy can do Sid had an aura Sid was a badass Sid had charisma I mean was Sid good in the ring no Sid was terrible Sid was a terrible wrestler I mean he was uncoordinated he was sloppy oh he was slow all that but the guys had something about him for one he had probably the most badass look for a wrestler ever I mean Come on, defy me to find someone who had a better look for pro wrestling than Psycho Sid. I mean, the guy just looked awesome. Like, this guy could fucking kill you in a heartbeat if he wanted to, type thing. Um, then, obviously, they get yeah, just the charisma about him. There was just something about him that was so cool. I mean, I loved his, I loved his promo style where, he shout like this, and then he talk softly like this. And then he'd go back to being crazy bastard Sid. And I used to love when 
He used to shout and call me and G the fat, bald headed little oaf. And then, oh, could I think his promos are just outstanding. Then the entrance, that awesome entrance where he's gets, getting himself psyched up onto the weight of the ring. His fist bump and the crown, all that. Just, oh. He just had so much energy about him. And then, just his presence, really. His presence, really. I mean, and just the presence of this guy is just so cool. I mean, obviously, like in 1996, he was, um, he was kind of, oh, when, when I faced Shawn Michaels and the old MSG crowd just turned on Shawn and went with Sid, that was really interesting. I think it was that, that role he had when he was um, champion in 1996-1997, he was kind of the first real tweener in the WWE. And if you look back in history, really, so he'd be facing Shawn at MSG and he'd be total babyface. And then obviously when he faced at the Royal Rumble, he'd be then heel. Then when he faced Bret Hart, to be more of a babyface when um, when Bret was slowly turning heel. But then when he faced the Undertaker at WrestleMania, then he was playing the total heel there to Undertaker's babyface. And they, I feel like, because um, obviously the attitude he was built around characters with shades of grey, like Stone Cold, like The Rock, like Triple H. And I feel, kind of feel like Sid was one of the first guys to really... Um, embrace that side the shades of grey because obviously before that you're either a heel or a baby face and whatever but with Sid he was just kind of who he was and sometimes the fans liked him and sometimes the fans hated him Um, one thing I don't I think that's an incorrect statement when you say people from my generation hate Sid I think more people who are just concerned about Dave Meltzer's star ratings and all these fancy spots don't like Sid because that's all I bothered about but because work, so quote unquote work rate is not the big all end all of what makes a good wrestler, you know. Because I feel like this generation kind of just thinks, oh, if someone can't have a 25 minute wrestling match with all these awesome spots, they suck. But that's not the case at all. I mean, Sid had the character, Sid had the charisma, Sid had the look, Sid had the presence. Sid was a cool motherfucker. And consider this Sid had a highly successful wrestling career despite having half the brain you do. Think about that. Then last question. Um, I'm not technically cheating with this one. I'll let you off for this one. But but if you only got your only band read bookers, you just don't say to people fantasy booking. You bastard. You are ah, loopholes there. Eh? Um, so um, so book a seven match card for NXT One Night Stand esque show featuring current NXT stars facing NXT alumni. You know. Kind of like the ECW one I stand right. So, got any anyone who's on the ECW uh, NXT roster at one time, I will do. So, um, not going to include the original NXT when NXT was a game show back in 2010, 2011, because it wasn't really the same thing. It was kind of NXT in name only, um, and it'd be kind of like comparing the original ECW to WWE's version of ECW. So, what we do on that? So, no Daniel Bryan. No Wade Barrett, no Ryback, etc. And also, I'm not going to include Roman Reigns because, yeah, Reigns was on NXT, but he was on NXT for like five minutes. I, mean, I bet he ba- I bet he barely made three or four pieces of NXT before going up on the Shield. And Dean Ambrose, of course, was never on NXT. Uh, Dean Ambrose was always a um, Ambrose was always a uh, FCW guy. And he wasn't on NXT TV, because um, obviously after FCW ended, then he wasn't on NXT TV. And then he came up with the Shield, so seven matches. So we're going to have two tag matches and then five singles matches. So we're going to have a four-woman tag team match. So we got uh, the four horsewomen, Charlotte, Bailey, Sasha Banks, Becky Lynch. To take on what I guess you can call the best of the rest, really. So you've got uh, she can face the team of Asuka. Shayna Baszler, Ember Moon, and Nia Jax. That, that'd be pretty cool. And then a six-man tag team match, Undisputed Era, Adam Cole, Roderick Strong, Kyle O'Reilly, to face the original Wyatt family. So, Bray Wyatt, Eric Rowan, Luke Harper. Back in the old Wyatt family gear, the old Wyatt family music, etc. So, I think that'd be a pretty sweet, entertaining match, um, to be honest with you. Then we've got big singles matches. Um, Tommaso Ciampa versus Shinsuke Nakamura. Wow, this match would be hard-hitting as hell. Get Shinsuke Nakamura back in that NXT um, 
back of the NXT thing. So yeah, a hard hitting match between two stiff guys. Just let them go at it and have a barn burner. And then the next next match kind of writes itself, and that's um, Adrian Neville versus Ricochet. I mean, come on, that's an obvious match, isn't it? Two great high flyers. Yeah. Then you have your spot match where we have a lot of awesome spots. So like Will Ospreay Ricochet style match. Now I'm pretty sure. I'm, I'm maybe Ricochet wrestled Pack back in the indie scene, but I'm not sure. I mean, if they have, I haven't heard about this match. It would probably happen. So obviously, Adrian Neville's awesome in NXT. And then you've got Ricochet, who's doing extremely well on NXT. Just let them go out and have the high-flying war then. Next, you get two big guys going at it, and that's Kevin Owens versus Samoa Joe. Now, this match only happened once on NXT. And it was on NXT TV, right after Joe came in. But it was like a 10-minute match or something, and it wasn't that great. Um. But this time, he's given them 15, 16 minutes and let them just beat the hell out of each other. I mean, this would be an awesome match for me. And um, 260 pounds Owens versus 280 pounds Joe. Just let them go up in what could be an amazing wrestler match. Finn Balor versus Johnny Gargano. I think this match would be unbelievable if it happened. And who knows, it might happen eventually one day in the future. I mean, obviously Finn Balor was probably... The face of NXT during that initial rise. Um, obviously, Johnny Gargano, I mean, his NXT run speaks for itself, so this match should be awesome. Then, main event, Seth Rollins versus Sami Zayn. Now, of course, Seth Rollins, you'd think that was the guys that really made his name at NXT. Probably, on the main roster, is probably going to be the most high-profile one. Um, Seth Rollins, of course, the first NXT champion. Was on NXT, was only on NXT for less than a year. Maybe six, eight months or something like that, but <coughs> helped lay the groundwork for NXT became. And of course, now I just feel like Sami Zayn's NXT run is getting so forgotten now. Because I feel like for me, Sami Zayn's probably my favourite NXT wrestler of all time. Because um, I was watching the match with him in Nakamura the other day, and yeah, just it's amazing the rise Sami Zayn had, the big matches with Cesaro, obviously the chase of the NXT title. Going beating Neville at Revolution, getting turned on by Kevin Owens, the whole Owens rivalry, then getting injured, and then coming back and finishing up his run of a classic with Nakamura. Um, yeah, this match would be great, I think. It gets Sami Zayn back as a babyface, and by the way, when Sami Zayn returns, can we please have him just return as a babyface, please? And just forget about that heel run that he had um, with his feud with Bobby Lashley. Let's just forget about that and bring Sami Zayn back as a babyface, but. Yeah, I think this would be definitely a worthy main event. So, thanks for the questions. And we go in. Um, yeah, the Destroyer BHB. Is the US title as good as dead? Yeah, I think it could come back. I mean, yes, it looks in a shitty position right now with um, the whole title switch between Rusev and Nakamura and then a comedy character R Truth suddenly winning the title for seemingly no reason. But yeah, I'm not going to deny the US title is in a pretty horrible spot right now. But it could be brought back to prominence. I mean, all it really takes is some, some good booking and uh, taking your time and all that. Because um, let's face it, various times we thought the Intercontinental title was as good as dead. Uh, but with good champions and good matches and good booking, it's been able to rise back to prominence over the last few years. So I don't see why the US title can't do the same. I mean, like, like I say, it's in a bad position. But I think it can be turned around. I really do. Then what we got next? For also numerous superstars asked to be released. Well, you know, it's, nobody really knows the truth. I mean, that's the thing now. You've got so many uh, Twitter accounts of people who claim to have inside knowledge and all that that all it takes is a couple of tweets and just gets retweeted out 200 times. And everyone takes it as facts. So, as far as I know, the only people who've asked in contract releases were the Revival. Maria and Mike Canellis, Hideo or Tommy. You know, obviously Dean Ambrose, but I think that's a separate situation. Um, but yeah, I think for me, if all elite wrestling does take off and uh, become successful, maybe Unhappy WWE Talent should go there. I mean, because I think that's what's happened in the last couple of years. We're finally in a position where wrestlers could make a decent living outside of WWE, where after they bought WCW out and all that type of thing, um, it wasn't really, so I'd say like 15 years ago, a lot of guys were stuck in WWE because there wasn't really anywhere else to make a proper living. So a lot of, it led to a lot of guys either just 
liking it or lumping it type thing. Um, but honestly, if I was one of them and they really were unhappy with WWE, I would say go. I, especially if you don't, if you're not married and you don't have a kid, I would say go out, explore this uh, other option. And if it doesn't work out and you're still young enough, you can go back to WWE. I mean, by all accounts, maybe WWE is pacifying the revival now. Uh, so maybe the revival won't try and get out the contract. But obviously, if Mike and Maria can else went, would anyone really? Would anyone really uh, notice type thing? So I think it's going to be an interesting situation to monitor over the next few months because obviously, by all accounts, is Tony Khan fella has a lot of money to spend. So if all elite are going to offer guys good contracts, then maybe they should consider it. And um, more we go. Favourite doing match of the year so far? That's an easy, that's probably the easiest question of the entire Q&A, to be fair. Easy answer is Johnny Gargano versus Ricochet from TakeOver Phoenix, I mean. There's not really a number t- any number two, to be honest with you, that match. Stands alone by itself has been an absolute classic. I mean, the only other match I can really think of were then the Tyler Bate and Trent Seven versus James James Drake and Zach Gibson from TakeOver Blackpool, but... Yeah, it's got, I mean, at the end of the year, Gargano Ricochet is probably going to be the rematch of the year, isn't it? I suppose unless they do Gargano versus Champer again, that might top it, but I don't think it will. Um, the worst match stipulation. So I'm going to give you two answers here. One being the actual concept, and the other being just a stupid stipulation added to a match. So as far as actual concept... It's hard, it's hard to look past the Kenneth from Hell, isn't it, from 1999? Oh, my God. Al Snow, big boss, man. Unforgiven. God, this is awful. Oh, God. Do I really want to sit and explain this? All right, then. So, in the storyline, Al Snow had a little dog called Pepe, a little chihuahua there. And then the big boss man, Doug Naft, said dog, because Al Snow had beaten for the hardcore title, and apparently that's him. Um, that triggers someone to steal people's dogs. So, Al, uh, boss man said he'd give Al Snow the dog back on his hotel on SmackDown. Um, so Al, but then he's going he's gonna to cook him some steak, a pepper steak at first. So he cooked Al Snow his dinner and then revealed. Oh my God! I can't even believe I'm saying this out loud. He revealed to Al Snow that um, Al, a uh, boss man had killed and uh, cooked up pepper and Al Snow just eating his own dog. Yeah. That's that. That's as ridiculous as it sounds. Fucking hell. So then, hell. So Pet was dead. Bossman's a dog murderer. And um, fed dog to Al Snow. Didn't get arrested or out, even though despite the fact it's happened on national TV. Yeah. Oh God. <clears throat> then, then Al Snow challenged Big Bossman to a match first. There's going to be a steel cage. Then a hell in a cell above that. And the con- <clears throat> concept was to. Get out of the steel cage and get out of the hell in the cell. Sounds easy enough, right? Uh, no, stipulation was in between the two cages. It was going to be a pack of wild Rottweilers. Uh, Bane for big boss man's blood and all that. Um, so oh, that sounds wonderful to feel you, right? You've got this great image in your head. Of these two cage matches. Um, these dogs barking and going crazy trying to get the big boss man and all that. But the problem is... You can't really get dogs to stick to the script. The fucking dogs. Dogs don't um, know the concept of um, sticking to a script. So instead of getting angry barking dogs, what we got was nice little playful dogs. You know like when, when you come in the house and the dog's all jumping up here and he wants to play and all that. He wants you to stroke him, tickle his tummy and all that sort of thing. So they were just nice little playful dogs. Um, they weren't rabbit or anything. Um, um, and, and they couldn't even show dogs on from uh, close-up shots. Why? Because dogs, the dogs were shitting on the floor. Not even serious. And uh, pissing on the floor. And I think there was even some little doggy humpers. Oh, good God. Yeah, that is bad. As far as a stipulation added to a match, I've got to go back to Rey Mysterio, Eddie Guerrero, SummerSlam 2005. Ladder match with a custody of Dominic. I mean, What? Really, I mean, WrestleMania's wrestling is just so bloody stupid, you know. So they were fighting over the fucking custody of a child. And so obviously the whole, I don't want to get into the big details of the story, but I'm um, Eddie Gray was Rey Mysterio's son's real father. Um, oh, God. And now Eddie Gray wanted, wanted Dominic back. 
and obviously but Rey Mysterio and his wife have been raising Dominic for all these years and the only way to solve this conflict of course is to have a ladder match at SummerSlam with the winner getting to have custody of Dominic god god this was stupid Ugh, god awful and the last question should two or five have their own takeovers yeah I don't see why not I mean I think it's definitely an experiment worth doing I mean because although it is cool you get these great matches on almost two or five lives, it would be nice if we got some live takers from time to time. So I think you should definitely experiment with it, uh, at least do one, see how it goes. And um, the only thing I would say they have to be realistic about the arenas that they go in. I mean, let's be honest, much as a lot of people like two or five live, two or five live is not going to sell out a 10,000 seat arena, are they? I mean, the reality for two or five live is there's a lot of good wrestling on, on there. But a lot of people don't really watch 205 Live. It's a relatively low watch show. Um, so the guy they could maybe do one 2,000 seat. Or maybe even just go to full sale and do one. So, But yeah, I think eventually they're going to have to start progressing and start trying them out. Um, so I would say yes. I would say at least try it. Then we got um, Devon 1097. Before Dean Ambrose leaving WWE's contract runs out. Fine, but wait. Yeah, if he's not happy, I mean, if Dean Ambrose is honestly unhappy with his position in WWE and maybe doesn't like the lifestyle anymore, doesn't like the travel, maybe he should leave, I mean, because obviously this is, seems to be happening, I mean, who knows, maybe something will get worked out and then WWE will end up getting a deal for Ambrose and he will end up re-signing, but as far as right now, it looks like Dean Ambrose is out the door in April after WrestleMania, and I'd say good on him, to be honest with you. I mean, Dean Ambrose is unhappy with creative. I mean, let's be honest, Dean Ambrose has probably done all right with money over the last few years. I mean, obviously, I don't know how much he's been paid, but he was one of Dewey's top um, full-time stars over the last three or four years. So, you'd think he'd probably make maybe low, low seven figures, like maybe just over a million dollars or maybe like in the 900,000 range a year. So... He's probably not hard up for money right now, so maybe he should go. I didn't just look at Dean Ambrose and WWE. I just can't help but think of disappointment. Just feel like overall his run has just been really like, ugh. I mean, it's, don't worry, he's had some high points, sure, but for the most part, I can't help but associate with disappointment. So examples, after he got hot in them initially when the Shield broke up with Seth Rollins, and then he got knocked down with that feud of Bray Wyatt, and Come, wrestle, come WrestleMania 31 time, Roman Reigns is in the main event of Brock Lesnar, Seth Rollins is cashing in that night to become the WWE Champion, and Dean Ambrose is just part of a ladder match. Yeah. And then, obviously, kind of as the alright 2015. 2016, he gets really, really hot, and gets the Brock Lesnar match, but then Brock Lesnar kind of squashed him, and just kind of completely halted his momentum, and then he gets another shot, wins the WWE title. Uh, it was the first draft pick for SmackDown. And his WWE title run was just kind of... It was okay. It wasn't a terrible title run or anything. But it wasn't really exciting either. And then just kind of after that... Then he was on the WrestleMania 33 pre-show. And obviously... Obviously when he moved to Raw, he kind of got lost in the shuffle. But then he ended up getting back to Seth Rollins and the Shield reunited. And then he got injured. And then he came back... And I think this last heel turn... This was supposed to be it for me. This was supposed to be when the real Dean Ambrose came out and Dean Ambrose really broke out. Because I feel like people have been talking about the Ambrose heel turn for probably at least two years, maybe even longer. And everyone has said, well, when Dean's a heel, that's when you're really going to see the best of him. But and I would say probably for things that weren't even Dean's own fault, the heel turn ended up being a massive flop and just failing and... He ended up just being kind of a lukewarm heel. So, so yeah, I think... Uh, and what Ambrose does... I mean, I think everyone's just assumed he's going to go and sign up all elite wrestling. But I wouldn't be all, I wouldn't be too sure about that, actually. Because I, I would honestly not be surprised if Ambrose just was a bit like CM Punk and just left wrestling entirely for a, at least a year or two. Because um, I feel like Dean Ambrose kind of is has that kind of personality... Where if he's not happy, he just wants to get out and do his own thing. Because I think, much like CM Punk, I don't think Dean Ambrose is really a people's person. I think he's not really a sociable guy. I mean, 
maybe he just wants to be out of the limelight for a little bit. And the thing is, Dean Ambrose is, what, 33 years old now, so there's always that option to come back in WWE or two or three years' time when he's in his mid-30s and have another run. So, if, if he part ways amicably now, WWE and Ambrose do, and Renee Young can keep a job with WWE, Ambrose can do whatever he wants, he's sign for All Elite, maybe have an indie run or just leave wrestling entirely. You can, go, you can come back in two or three years and be in a good position. Now we go. So yeah, obviously another one, Charles should be front of the Becky Ronda field. Obviously I explained that in the first question, but I'd rather not. But it's what it's what it is. Um, what a favourite wrestling t-shirts of all time. Well, I've got to go with the classics, you know. You mean, you know the iconic Austin 316 t-shirt, the first one? I mean, that's obviously when you think of wrestling t-shirts, especially in WWE. That's the one that really sticks out in everyone's mind. Obviously, the classic NWO shirt, just an epic, epic design. I mean, here we are all these years later, and you still see NWO shirts from time to time. Um, the CM Punk shirt from Money in the Bank 2011. That was an awesome t-shirt. I mean, some, some, I have some of the rest of the t-shirts are lame, though. Um, um, all, the, left, all the John Cena shirts are just embarrassing. And I'll say... Macho, the old Macho Man t-shirt from like the 80s with all these different colours but it's uh, the glasses of Macho Man's face and then Macho Man so that's, you, you probably know what I'm on about if you see it um, even Austin's 2001 Austin 316 shirt and um, the one in red the one of Austin 316 in red you might have seen that one but for the most part I'm not really a big wrestling t-shirt guy Especially as an adult, I've only really had one wrestling t-shirt, and that's that CM Punk 2011 shirt. Um, you know, it's just what it is, but um, then we got him. Um, no, you didn't review it, and you had your reasons, but your brief overall thoughts and disaster was Crown Jill. Not watched it, not going to watch it, don't really give a shit. Looked like a complete piece of shit. Um, yeah, it just looked awful, and I have absolutely zero interest in watching it, zero interest in reviewing it. Um, we got do you, at this point do you want to see the rock wrestle one more time yeah that'd be nice i mean i really i, I would like to see the rock at least have one more match and um, because yeah I, I refuse to count that eric rowan match at wrestlemania 32 that was not a real match that was just like what that was like what six seconds or whatever the fuck it was so his last proper match for me was um against john c at wrestlemania 29 and uh that's just, I didn't really like that. That is Rock being the Rock's last match. I mean, the the match was so so. Probably nobody really wanted to see it. Wasn't really that well received. And of course, the end with the Rock and Dawson Cena is probably the most manufactured WrestleMania moment in history. I mean, ah, uh, people just didn't buy it, and this is kind of not a very good way for the Rock to go out. So, I would like to say the Rock at least have one more match before he retires. Now, of course. There's a good chance it's probably never going to happen now because obviously, let's be honest, the Rock's Hollywood career comes first. I mean, that just makes sense, right? The Rock's Hollywood career has to come first. I mean, no ifs, ands, or buts. I mean, because obviously in his last match you've seen, he tore, well, he tore a muscle. I can't remember which one it was. And that ended up delaying uh, delaying his filming. For, I think it was for Hercules, I think it was. So, And obviously, movie directors... Not very happy that the main actor got hurt by playing wrestling, so uh, it's probably probably not going to happen now. I mean, there was talk he was going to wrestle. I think the plan was for him and Ronda to face Triple H and Stephanie at WrestleMania 32, and then there was talk of him doing something at WrestleMania 34 this year, last year, and obviously there was rumours last year that he was going to come back for WrestleMania 35. Um, but looking at it now, looking at the landscape, there's not really anything on the horizon for the Rock. I mean. I think a lot of people thought he was going to come back to face Roman Reigns, but of course, Reigns is out indefinitely now, so I would say I would love to have one last match and then go to the Hall of Fame retire. I mean, for me, and this is just me, I would kind of love to see The Rock versus Triple H one more time, because obviously that's one of my biggest feuds growing up. I mean, I don't know if you remember, a few years ago on SmackDown, they did a face-to-face promo backstage, and it got fans really excited for the prospect of another Rock-Triple H match. And who knows, maybe if Roman Reigns comes back, maybe he can put Reigns over and then retire, who knows. But, yeah, I'd be pretty happy with that. And then we've got, uh, we've got how, how many sets of questions have we got left? Ah, f- no, five more sets of questions. All oh, right. 
Um, the double X Prince, how do you feel about uh, Danny Bryan and Eric Rowan teaming up? Yeah, it's fine. I mean, obviously, it's in the beginning stages. I mean, obviously, this whole thing is going to develop later on. But I think it's pretty cool. I think it's actually pretty entertaining, to be fair. It makes sense. Obviously, small champion like Peel champion like Bryan having a big monster heel to back him up in Eric Rowan. Pretty much works. Um, obviously, Rowan was doing nothing after Luke Harper went out injured and the Bludgeon brothers had to go away. Um, but I do get a feeling Luke Harper might come back and then team with Eric Rowan, so Harper and Rowan. Could be behind be behind Brian's side, which could be pretty cool. But I think it's a, a could, could be pretty good. Um, what have we got? Kurt Angle retires in WWE. Who should be his last opponent? I think Kurt Angle will retire in WWE, and I think it's coming pretty soon, within the next year or two. I mean, I look at the last few matches Kurt Angle's had. The guy just the guy does not look good. I mean, he, he can still do some things well, but his physical condition just does not look good at all. I mean. Every time he takes a bump, it kind of looks like, ugh, is he going to get back up from this? I mean, sometimes it even looks like he has problems standing up straight. So I feel it will come. And I remember he asked me this question before and answered Jason Jordan. But, however, by all accounts, Jason Jordan's career is very much up in the air. So for me, I'll say if Kurt Angle had one last match and then retired and I, and I had the power to pick who that opponent would be, It'd be Daniel Bryan for me. I mean, that's a dream match. I think a lot of people have wanted to see that match for a lot of years. Um, obviously, it never happened because um, Angle was in WWE. Bryan was still on the independent scene. And then, obviously, Bryan went to uh, WWE. Kurt Angle was in TNA. And then, obviously, Kurt Angle comes back to WWE. Daniel Bryan's retired. But then, Bryan came back this year. So, pretty much late last year, this year, there's only times Brian and Angle have been on the same roster at the same time. And I think, like, if, yeah, if Kurt Angle had one more match, it would be with Daniel Bryan. For two reasons. One, because it's a big dream match. And number two, because they could just have a nice technical wrestling match where they just wrestle on the mat and don't do a lot of stuff. So they don't have to take a lot of bumps. They can just have a, a fantastic wrestler match on the mat. I mean, so I think that would be, be a nice way for Angle to go out here and put over Daniel Bryan. Yeah. Best overall year for the women's division on the main roster. Got to be last year, isn't it, right? I mean, and I think this year is going to be even better. So, yeah, 2007, 2018 has to be. Because obviously I could say 2019, but we're only like six weeks into the year. So, yeah, 2018 has to be. I mean, obviously they had the Evolution pay-per-view this year. They had someone like Ronda Rousey come in, absolutely tearing it up. Uh, obviously Charlotte and Becky Lynch. you got Asuka. You got Sasha and Bailey. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously last year Alexa Bliss, Nia Jax. I mean, last year was pretty much the best it's ever been. So I say right now, the last this last little period, best it's ever been. So yeah, 2018. And I dare say the the, the, the fact that they're probably going to main event WrestleMania this year. Yeah, 2019 is going to be even better. Here we go. Just like Mustafa Ali, who else would you? Like from 205 Live to come to the main roster. So, yeah, I could be surprised with Mustafa Ali, actually. I didn't think he was going to be the guy who could uh, come to Raw SmackDown and do well, but he has. I mean, he's done really well. So, other guys, I think Cedric Alexander's the first one to come to mind. I mean, he's been on 205 Live since day one. He was in the original Cruiserweight Classic. Him and Ibushi arguably stole the tournament, that tournament. And obviously, he had his rise in Cruiserweight title reign. And surprisingly, he's pretty much since he lost the Cruiserweight title run, he's kind of just been in the background. Um, so, yeah, I think he could definitely go to Raw SmackDown, maybe after WrestleMania, and have a pretty decent run. I mean, I don't think he's going to be a top guy, but I think he could be definitely a good, strong mid-card or upper mid-card on the main roster. Um, I think Buddy Murphy's endgame... Buddy Murphy's endgame's got a result in them getting promoted to the main roster. So, like, that was the whole point in going to 205 Live to prove himself. Well, let's face it, Buddy Murphy is um, he could he could bulk back up and be like 215, 220, go back to the main roster. And obviously, now he's just such a well rounded wrestler now. I feel like he could do really, really well on the main roster. I mean, that'd be pretty good to see. But those are the two ones really I could think of off the top of my head. Um, Cedric Alexander and Buddy Murphy. 
maybe someone like Drew Gulak could come to the main roster and do all right for himself. Because obviously, I think he's got this air. Uh, he, he kind of reminds you he's a smaller badass. Of, I think he's quite believable in what he does. Obviously, Tony Nice has the look with him. With his physique and all that, maybe Tony Nice can do something on the main roster. So those are the main guys I can think of, really. Um, that's an interesting question, because you asked us before SmackDown. Any chance we'll ever see the New Day singles competitors? Well, I would have said I'm su- by now I'm surprised it hasn't happened already. I mean, I'm very surprised that Big E hasn't broke out and had a singles run. I mean, I always thought Big E was going to be doing what he's done in the New Day, that he was eventually going to break out. Um, and I think that's still in the cards, I think that'll still happen, but now it looks like... We don't know how long this will last, I mean... They might just do this at Elimination Chamber and put him back in the tag situation with Kofi Kingston, of course. And replaced by Staffer Ali. Had that awesome performance in the gauntlet the other night on SmackDown. Now it's going to be the Elimination Chamber. So could that possibly lead to a long-term singles run for him? I don't know. I mean, it'd be pretty nice if it did, to be fair, because who's been there? Not many guys have been there longer than Kofi Kingston on the main roster. I mean, the only one I can really think of is Randy Orton, the Miz. Dolph Ziggler's been there about, about the same time, so, yeah, that'd be pretty sweet, really. So, yeah, I think there's every chance we'll definitely see either Big A or Kofi Kingston break out in the singles, because I think Xavier Woods is what he is. I mean, he's entertaining on the microphone and all that, and he's a pretty good talker, but yeah, I, don't, I just don't really see him as a single star, where with Kofi and Big A, I definitely see potential there. Maybe, eventually... One of them will turn heel. And then maybe, maybe Big E will turn heel and get into a serious monster heel. Who knows? I mean, only time will tell that. Um, then we've got Mr. No Cloud. Which, who are the wrestlers who you think should leave and go to AEW? So, probably top of the list has to be The Revival. Now, I know they won the ta- titles on Raw, but you think, how long is this push going to last? I mean, yeah, they've been, they've been pushed now, but is it, they're really just going to get bored of them in a couple of months. And they'll back, be back to where they were. So, those are the main ones I would love to see. Just go and then see what happens. I mean, I could say Dolph Ziggler, but... Uh, I just get the feeling Dolph Ziggler's never going to leave. It's one of those things... You think you think Dolph Ziggler's going to leave the WWE. And then it looks like he's gone for a bit. And then he just comes back. And then then, you, then he may, maybe has a good match or two. Then he's then he just reminded how still he is and how long he's been around for. I mean... God, just go. Go to AEW or something. Do something else with your career type thing. Uh, Zack Ryder, I think he's one. He just needs... He just, these guys just needs to get out of the WWE right now. And just do something else with his career. Because he's been in the same spot for years and years. And the problem is, because of that, he's not really improved as a wrestler. I mean, can you look back at Zack, Zack Ryder any better now as a wrestler than he was, like, say, seven, eight, nine years ago? Not really. Um and he's still like 33, 34. And I th- I'm pretty sure he's decent friends with Cody Rhodes. So just go, have a leave the WWE for a bit. Do something else, man. Maybe create a new character. Come up with a new in ring style, something. Find an opportunity somewhere else to grow as a performer. And maybe you can even come back to the WWE. Um, what have we got? I think Al, uh, Gallows and Anderson, they've got to go. They've got to go. I think their contracts are up later this year, I think. Could be wrong about that, but I believe it is. But they've they've just got to get out. I mean, let's face it, their dude really runs sucked. I mean, there's no real nice way to put it. Gallows and Anderson and dude really have sucked. Um, it just hasn't gone well from at all. Um, they came under so much hype as well coming in from New Japan and the Bullet Club with AJ Styles. Yeah, but yeah, just for one reason or other, it's just not worked out. And what the hell are they doing now? Nothing really. Um, so obviously if you go back to all the leash, you've got a few of the young bucks waiting for you. You could even feud a Daniel Cesarian. Um, and whoever whoever the hell else uh, all the league brings in next. Because you think, oh, I think Beretta and Chuck Taylor are going there, aren't they? This is the so-called best friends or whatever the fuck you call them. Um, so that'll be interesting. Obviously as far as women, maybe from like M. Moon. It was just being so underutilised in the main roster, it's not even funny anymore. Because she came up after a WrestleMania last year, it just hasn't really done much. I mean, she's definitely been overshadowed by other performers here. Um, so, whether she goes to All Elite Wrestling, she could be 
maybe the star of the women's division over there and really make a name for herself. But who knows? I think Chad Gable, maybe. Because Gable, I think Gable's probably the, one of the most underutilised guys in the main roster. Um, I think Bobby Roode, once his contract ends, I think obviously now Bobby Roode's in his 40s, just hasn't gone well for him on the main roster. Maybe a change of scenery is exactly what he needs. Um, but it's going to be interesting over the next few, like, year or two, see how many guys actually willingly make the jump to WWE to All Elite. Um, but I think All Elite have to be careful, though, to not hire too many ex-WWE guys, because, I mean, that's kind of what TNA did back in the day. They would just hire anyone who had a WWE career and put them in a decent position, and the kind of the perception was is them. Um, WWE rejects will go to TNA, so hopefully all elite are careful and don't sign every single person that becomes available and is very selective about it. But it's going to be interesting to monitor over the next couple of years. <coughs> if, if, ah, if Johnny Gargano goes in this run of classic matches for another three years, will he be in the discussion of the greatest of all time? In ring performance, yeah, I guess. I mean, can't really see why not. Yeah. Uh, Greatest of all time, though. I mean, his overall packages, I mean, probably not, because obviously, uh, it's not really comparable, is it? I mean, when you think of the greatest of all time, you probably think of, like, Hogan, Austin, Rock, Macho Man, Flair, and Johnny Gargano's nothing like those guys, but as far as in-ring performance, yeah, I mean, obviously, look at his when he's had in NXT, it's been amazing, but I dare say, and I know I'm probably being pessimistic here, but when Gargano goes up the main roster, I dare say it's likely going to be downhill for him, I mean, He's not really, He's not going to get these opportunities on the main roster, is he? Like, I mean, honestly, I'm genuinely scared for Johnny Gargano and Tommaso Ciampa going up to the main roster. Do you think, oh, it's not going to go well? I mean, I hope, I hope I'm wrong, but probably not. I mean, but yeah, I was like, hypothetically, he goes in a similar run for the next two or three years, and yeah, he probably should be one of the best in-ring performers in WWE history. Will the rise of AEW force and help do a restep of the game? Hopefully. I mean, that's, that's the hope, I mean, that's what the hope I have, um, I really do. I mean, it's been said that WWE's always been better with competition, and that was proven in the Monday Night Wars. I mean, WCW really made them race again. I mean, it's, it's, a wait, it's a wait and see situation for me, because, yeah, All League does have a lot of hype around it, and there's a lot of um, promise behind it, but they've yet to prove anything yet. I mean, they've got, people need to give this All League thing time, and, so saying like six months, it's not really competitive with the way people just need to calm the F down. I think the one thing it will do, I think the main difference we'll see is um, the wrestlers themselves will have more leverage now. They could either use All Elite Wrestling to try and get a bigger push out of WWE or use All Elite Wrestling to try and get more money out of WWE contract-wise. And that's great. That's really, really great for the business, to be honest. I mean, it's always nice when the wrestlers have more power. Um, I think that's going to be the big difference more than anything because obviously all leagues, yeah, they can sell our things, but oh, if, you, if you see the money WWE makes, it's, I think it's pretty much incompa- incomparable to be honest with you. Um, <clears throat> if you run a wrestling company and you had to choose between, oh, cause this, this is a poison choice, isn't it? If you had to choose between Jim Cornette and Vince Russo to be hedge right, who would you choose? Oh, right. nice choices there, like Vince Russo or Jim Cornette, good God, um, oh, if I had to pick, I'd probably go with Cornette, because, oh, yes, they both, they both have the flaws, um, and yes, they're both out of touch, and people say that, yes, Vince Russo is behind the times and out of touch as well, because Vince Russo is still stuck in the Attitude Era, and obviously the, the, the way Vince Russo used to write television in the Attitude Era simply wouldn't work in 2019, Jim Cornette's stuck in the old territory days, um, but if I had to pick one, I'd have to go with uh, Cornette because uh, I find him a lot less obnoxious than Russo. I mean, yeah, Cornette's annoying, and, but if you actually so as you listen to what he actually says and not his angry demeanour, it's not like, God damn, fucking kid, these days don't know what they're doing, too many high spots, motherfucker. But if you actually like listen to what he says, he actually does talk a lot of sense and a lot of what he says is actually right. It's just because he's so aggressive about his opinions and all that, and I think mean, it turns a lot of people off. Um, and it's something, yeah, he can start, kind of sound like an old man yelling at the clouds sometimes. 
But it actually, he knows what he's talking about. The guy's been in the business for, God, 40 years or whatever the hell it's been now. I mean, the guy knows his stuff. He's he's an intelligent guy. He's uh, got great knowledge. And, yeah, I think I'd, I'd rather work with someone like Cornette than work with someone like Russo. Oh, because I mean, I can just, just imagine, like, bro, you got to have swerves, bro. I could, I could imagine, like, asking Vince Russo to do something. Then he'd go the complete opposite way and he'd be like, why have you done that? Bro, you got to swerve the people, bro. They never saw it coming, bro. God, I just think, I think I'd, I think I'd hear, I'd like spend time with Vince Russo. I think I'd want to strangle him because he's just, that, that that voice, that fucking, ugh. Bro, call me bro every five minutes, wanting to do swerves and all that sort of shit. Um, wanting to put the title on actors and crappy things like that, so... If I could have my choice, I'd probably at least... I think I could work with... I think I could at least tolerate Cornet more than Russo. And his 2020s... Tw- ah, fucking hell, this is well. His 2020s next year, who was the rest of the decade, the 2010s? Well, I mean, answers probably changed over the last few years. But I, I, did, I used to always say it was CM Punk, but now, you look at it, CM Punk's last match was January 2014. So CM Punk's been gone for over five years now. And and here's one for me, because when I said those things, I didn't know really anything about New Japan. So my answer is now is Okada has to be the rest of the decade for me, definitely. I mean, got to be, to be honest. Um, because he, he, hasn't really, he got the push in 2012 to be the IWGP champion. And since then, it's gone on a phenomenal run. He's won the G1 Climax. He's main event. Hang on. Wrestle Kingdom 7, 8, 9, 10. 11, 12, made about six Wrestle Kingdoms, no, no, five Wrestle Kingdoms, because he didn't, no, no, like, five Wrestle Kingdoms, yeah, two G1 Climaxes, four IWGP title matches, title reigns, sorry, uh, numerous, numerous classic matches, the likes of Tanahashi, Kenny Omega, Suzuki, Ishii, I mean, the list of matches had pretty much speaks for itself, to be honest with you, so, Gotta be Okada for me, surely. I mean, surely gotta be Okada. Um, although another close second, I'll probably go with AJ Styles as number two, who I think as far as American guys has surpassed CM Punk. Because obviously you look at it, one of the AJ did had that phenomenal New Japan run for 2014-2015, and then transitioned into WWE and had that incredible year, 2016. I mean, AJ Styles is 2016. You've got to put up with it. A lot of people's great years, to be honest with you. That was probably one of the best overall years in WWE history for a single wrestler. Then even 17, 18, yeah, maybe he's not been quite as good as he was in 16, but he's been, I, he's probably been one of the top guys in WWE since that time. Spent a lot of time for the WWE Championship, all that good shit. So I'll probably go AJ number two and Okada number one. Then we got Liam 1995. Well, your overall thoughts on the Reigns versus Lesnar match at WrestleMania 31? Well, I feel that style of match has become cliche. I feel that match is underrated. Yeah, that was, a, that was an awesome match, to be honest with you. And yeah, you're right. The style is cliche now, but at the time, it's what people wanted to see because it was not long after Lesnar had destroyed John Cena at SummerSlam. And it's one of those matches where I think they really turned chicken shit into chicken salad because people were not hyped for this match at all. Believe me, people were not interested in watching Reigns versus Lesnar at this WrestleMania. But then they, they kind of got the crowd in by just having a phenomenal match. I mean, it was a really brutal physical match. I mean, the uh, Roman Reigns took a lot of punishment for Brock Lesnar in that match. Um, Brock Lesnar really just destroyed Roman Reigns. Reigns tried to make a little comeback. And of course, the awesome twist at the end with Seth Rollins cashing the money in the bank. Absolute genius move, so... Fucking them. So then we got a great finish out of it as well. And um, so looking back, you think Reigns has had four WrestleMania main events now, and that was the only one that was really a success. The first one, because of the the second one, the match of Triple H, which is average at best. And uh, the Undertaker match, uh, I probably cut Reigns some slack in that one because then um, he was pretty much wrestling a broken down Undertaker and had to try and carry him. And the Brock Lesnar match last year just didn't go well, which is so frustrating because you look at it and think, um, my God, you look at the match you had at Wrestle. Why didn't you just have that match last year? You know, 
And so instead they had that crappy little match where all the finisher spamming and all that shit. And I, know, I know the fans were trying to hijack the match, but maybe if they had the kind of match they had at WrestleMania 31, maybe they wouldn't have, you know. Um, but yeah, it's probably probably one of probably one of Roman Reigns' most defining matches. And it was a great WrestleMania main event. And then we go. Uh, what's better overall, Undertaker versus Sean at WrestleMania 25 or the Hell in a Cell match? I'll go with the Hell in a Cell match because oh, I just I love that match so much. I mean, there's no right or wrong answer here, really. These are two of the best matches in pro wrestling history, without a doubt. I mean, Shawn Michaels as Undertaker 1997, then in 2009. Two different time periods, but two amazing matches. But for me, I go off the first Hell in a Cell match of Bad Blood. I mean, that match is definitely one of the greatest matches of all time. Probably in my top 10 favourite wrestler matches all time period. Just absolute class. But that's from my childhood years as well. So I think when I, when I have to choose, I think most people go with what they grew up with. And I grew, grew up watching that match. I feel I was about I think I was 11 when that match happened. Um, just, uh, and obviously what it spawned really. the Spawned the Hell in a Cell gimmick. Which became probably one of the most iconic gimmick matches in WWE history. So... I've got to go with the Sean and Taker match for me anyway. <clears throat> Overall, Thorsten HBK, Randy Orton, Survivor Series 2007. Underrated as fuck match. I mean, that match is underrated as hell. That match is awesome, actually. It's a fantastic story as well, because obviously the whole premise behind the match was that um, Sean might as couldn't use a super kick or would be disqualified, and then Orton would retain the title, and then Orton couldn't deliberately get himself disqualified, so... A nice little story there. So Sean Michaels had to wrestle a different type of match. Try again. Do because he did all these submission moves and all, and to try and come up with new finishes. Then he would tease doing the super kick, then stop doing and not do it and type thing. Sean was a great babyface. Orton was a great heel. Because I think this was right in the middle of the best run of Orton's entire career, when he was the WWE champion at the end of 2007, going to 2008. That for me was the best run of Orton's career, and the finish was outstanding as well. Where Sean going for a super kick and then having to stop himself. Then Orton taking advantage of that by hitting an RKO out of nowhere. They get the win on Sean Michaels. So yeah, I love this match actually. Who when do you think the Undertaker will retire? And who do you think his last match? Who will be his last match? Oh, I don't know. I mean, a lot of people seem to speculate the Undertaker has retired now. But I don't truly believe that. I don't I won't truly believe the Undertaker's retired. Until the announcement's made, because you never really know a thing. But I hate to say, he should, he should never come back after WrestleMania 33. Sorry to say that, but uh, it's just true, isn't it? I mean, I love and respect The Undertaker, but that should have been it the whole match with Roman Reigns. Putting the hat in the coat and the ring and all that, having that incredible send off. That should, that should have been the end. Should never have came back. I mean, let's be honest. Ugh. I love the guy, but this is probably one of the saddest ends of a career I've ever seen. Because if he came back, had the match with Cena, which was a squash. The Rusev match was okay, but just okay. And then, I think the last two matches he had, Super Showdown, Crowl Joke. I blame WWE so much for this, though. I mean, the match with Triple H, he had that match. The match was like 27 minutes, I mean. Are you fucking kidding me? Who the fuck wanted to see Triple H Undertaker go for that long? The match should have been 15 minutes maximum. Same with the Crown Jewel. That Crown Jewel match, it was just not good. Undertaker's performances in both matches were just, oh, not good. And that, obviously the match he had with Roman Reigns, his performance in there was pretty sad as well. Um, so, but the thing is, his last match, it's kind of a tough one for me because all I wanted to retire... I don't want that. I don't want his last match to be in Crown Jewel and that highly controversial Saudi show and that horrible match. I mean, if he has one last match, he's got to either be WrestleMania this year or he takes the entire year off and has final retirement at WrestleMania 36. I mean, that could be. He could do the he could do the Hall of Fame the night before and then wrestle whoever. Because Undertaker's last. I think he deserves a match to be built. His retirement match to be built as such. And have an epic storyline behind it. And then Undertaker puts someone else over. Then rides off into the sunset. Um, so I think he deserves one more WrestleMania match. Because his last match should be at WrestleMania. Not a crown jewel. Or even if he... Oh, you know. It's just... 
Yeah. I, 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 I find it hard to shit on the Undertaker because I respect him so much. I mean, I really, really do. I mean, I absolutely love the guy, but yeah, it should have ended it. It's, it's time to pack it in. Um, for, uh, I think he has one more match at a WrestleMania and then calls it a day for good. For good this time, no comebacks. Then, last question. Is WWE's programming truly downright horrendous like a lot of people are making out to be? Or is it more that the shows are becoming longer and more repetitive as a result is bland? I would actually say you are 100%. I think that's a 100% correct statement, actually. I would totally agree with you there, to be fair. Um, yeah, I feel like you're right. I mean, because I've seen some truly bad wrestling. I mean, I've been through the WWF and WCW in 1995. I mean, I've been through WCW in 1999, 2000. And the WWE product now is nowhere near as bad as that. But I think your last line about it being long and repetitive and just bland is actually 100% accurate. I think that's a problem more than anything for me. I mean, obviously, obviously you had like the Raw Rumble was like, what, pushing five hours. And then you have three hours of Raw, two hours of SmackDown, a pay-per-view every month, sometimes two pay-per-views a month. And these pay-per-views are regularly going over four hours now. And the thing about it, it's, it's kind of hard for the writers not to, um, not to be repetitive because... For all the people who say, oh, I could do a better job than the writers for WWE, can you really, can you really write three hours of fresh television on Monday every single week and then keep it fresh and entertaining and not have it be repetitive? And then you've got a pay-per-view to build up every month, sometimes two pay-per-views a month. So it's a, I, think the, I think the writers have it very hard. I mean, I think the writers are getting a very bad rap at the moment. Yes, absolutely they could do a better job, but... I think it's a very, very difficult job for anyone to do. Um, but that's just me. Um, but yeah, I would actually agree with you. I feel like... I think, yeah, I think repetitive and bland is a better way to describe Raw, at least especially Raw right now, than um, being outright horrendous. I mean, I've seen a lot worse wrestling than, than what Stuart Dewey is offering up these days. Then we got um, Cody Bernard. Um, who are your favourite Japanese wrestlers of all time? Since I've only been in New Japan the last fan the last couple of years, so... I'll give you some, obviously, obviously, I think Okada is the one for me now, because I think like his matches with Omega, and that was really what got me into watching Japanese wrestling, so, because of that, obviously, watching, a lot of the awesome matches in that last title reign, is what really got me hooked on in New Japan, so, I've uh, got to go with Okada then, I just love Tomohiro Ishii, badass, love his work, so aggressive in the ring, just awesome, then, same talk, I just love Minoru Suzuki, so realistic in what he does in the ring, just really, really badass. And of course, Tanahashi, although I'm starting, I think I like Tanahashi more and more now, but it took me a while to like really, really like him. Because I see I miss Tanahashi's big, big run in the late 2000s, early 2010s, so I wasn't there for that, so I don't really have that emotional connection to Tanahashi like maybe some of the longest term New Japan fans do. But I definitely recognize this man's a legend. And maybe the greatest of all time in terms of Japanese wrestling. But those are pretty much my four standouts. Then obviously there's guys like Naito who I really like. But I don't, I don't outright love Naito as much as some people. But I do like him. Kota Ibushi, same. A fan of him, but not like a gigantic fan of them type thing. Um, and what have we got? So, so you think they should do an AJ Styles Seth Rollins feud? Yeah, and I think they will. I mean, because... I think... Because I think... Superstar shit, I think AJ Styles going to Raw would make sense now. Because he's been on SmackDown since the beginning of the brand split. And obviously, with Roman Reigns' stairs, um, being out indefinitely, nobody knows when or if he's coming back. I mean, it could be another year, it could be two years, it could be never. It could be six months, who knows? So there's that massive uncertainty about Roman Reigns' future. So I feel like having AJ... So what I would do personally is switch Finn Balor and AJ Styles around, so... Finn Balor can go to SmackDown and have a... I think you have a WWE title run SmackDown, actually. But that's just me. And AJ Styles can go to Raw. And you think if AJ Styles went to Raw, you're thinking, hopefully... Now, I say hopefully because you never know if this company, Seth Rollins, becomes the Universal Champion of WrestleMania. And let's just hope that happens. I mean, let's be honest, there's a good chance they'll fuck us over and keep the fucking belt on Lesnar. But, um, so... Yeah, so that would that, that'd be ideal for SummerSlam, in my opinion. 
But how about that? SummerSlam, Seth Rollins, AJ Styles for the Universal title. Because obviously AJ can go to Raw. Then he can build towards a Seth Rollins match. Because I think that's the match everyone's wanted to see AJ have in WWE. But it's never happened before. I mean, I think it happened like in 2006 when AJ Styles versus Tyler Black. But like, Tyler Black, he was like a year at the business. I mean, I think also I think AJ Seth Rollins, as far as whoever's who's in WWE right now, it's probably the biggest dream match they could have. Um, so yeah, that'd be. So I think they should definitely do it. Uh, what are your opinions of the greatest match in wrestling history? Good question. Um, but for me, there's one. The one match I always say is the greatest match that I've ever seen personally. It's Ric Flair, Ricky Steamboat, Class of the Champions, 6 April 1989, total 3 for the NWA Championship. If you haven't seen that match, you absolutely have to watch it. I mean, this is wrestling at its absolute finest. Awesome story, great pace. Two of the best wrestlers of all time, peaking at the same time. Great babyface, great heel. Two guys that knew each other so well because they'd had so many matches with each other. I mean, those matches, really. Those 389 matches, Chai Town Rumble, Clash of Champions, and Wrestle War 89. Every wrestling fan has to see those three matches. Just trust me on that, you really do. So, for, but for me, Blair Steamboat, Clash of the Champions, love that match. There we go. This is an interesting one because you wrote this before New Beginning. So, um, should New Japan make Jay White the IWGP champion? Now, obvious answer here is yes, Jay White is now the IWGP champion. It happened. Um, I would have said no, because I just feel like, uh, I'm not convinced by Jay White. I mean, I think he deserves a chance, but I'm not, I'm not convinced by him. I feel, in a nutshell, I feel like he's a good wrestler who's being pushed as a world-class wrestler, if that makes sense, so... I don't know. I mean, you know, so he is the IWGP champion, one of the youngest in history. So I, I do admire New Japan for having the balls to go with this, because he went all out to create a brand new star. And what I think most impressed by, they haven't been afraid to let the top guys lose to him. I mean, look at that. He beat Okada and Tanahashi in the G1 climax, beat Kenny Omega last year, and then in quick succession, beat Okada clean at Wrestle Kingdom. Beat Tanahashi clean at the new beginning, so... Because I feel like if Dewey Reed did something similar, like, say when John Cena was around as a top guy, they, they would have done some lame finish where Cena still looks strong, but the other guy gets a shitty fluke victory, which is, like, whatever. So, the, the new fans gone a lot on JY, so... It's up to him now. He has to prove himself right now, because New Japan has done all he can for him. They've given him everything. They've given him the push. They've booked him extremely well. So it's up to Jay White now to prove he can hang because I know I've always said stuff like work race, not everything, but I think in New Japan it kind of is. Because I think it's different from WWE in that regard because obviously big staple of the promotion is those massive main event matches that go 25, 30, 35, 40 minutes, have all those classic matches. And I'm just not sure if Jay White's capable of doing that yet. Um, so let's see. I mean, this is going to be an interesting one. Um, I don't know how long Jay White's going to be the champion. Um, if I if he goes, at least gets Dominion with the title. Yeah, maybe even go to Wrestle Kingdom next year. I don't know. Because I feel like overall, Naito should be the champion. I mean, if it was up to me, I would have had Naito be the one to be the next IWGP champion and have that long reign as champion. Um, but I do think Okada's probably getting the belt back within the next year. But that's just me. So for me, it's like, I'm yet to be convinced about JY. So my uh, thing right now is, um, let's just give the guy a chance to see what he can do. Then we've got the last set of questions come from Owen Peterson. Now, it's, no, no, there's two more sets of questions, excuse me. Um, yeah, well, so uh, best WCW match of each year from 1988 to 2001. So obviously, 88, I'm going to just go through the whole year because... Technically, it wasn't WCW until, like, November or whatever it was. Um, I think it was, like, either October or November of 88, Ted Turner bought the company, and the NWA became WCW. But I'm just going to go through the entire year. So, 88 has to be Ric Flair versus Sting, Class of the Champions 1, 45 minute draw for the NWA title. That's classic match that still holds up. 89, 
Flair Steamboat from Class of Champions. 6-2 out of 3 falls for the NWA title. 1990, it's got to be, for me, Midnight Express versus the Southern Boys and Great American Bash. That's one of those matches that nobody remembers. But it was bloody awesome. I mean, this match was fantastic. It really, really was. I mean, it's definitely probably one of the most underrated classic matches of all time. Has to be seen. 1991, you got to go off the War Games match with him. Um, Sting, Steiner Brothers, Brian Pillman versus the Four Horsemen. Uh, Wrestle War. Awesome match. Love that match. Now, say Ditto for 1992. you got to go off the War Games again. Sting Squadron versus the Dangerous Alliance. I mean... The best War Games match of all time. Absolute classic. 1993, you've got to go with um, Ric Flair versus Vader from Starcade. That's A1. Amazing match. Absolutely fantastic stuff. Be just great, 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 great match. 1994, of course, you've got to go with Ric Flair, Ricky Steamboat from Spring Stampede. Yeah, it wasn't on the level of the 89 matches, but it was still an awesome wrestling match, it has to be seen. 1995 is a tough one because there's not really that many choices to be honest with you. Three stars match quality in 1995 was a pretty bad year for WCW, but I'll go with this. This is a surprise one, really. Brian Pillman versus Johnny V. Bad from Fall Brawl 1995. What that was an awesome opener, actually. I mean, for the I think no, it was I think it was for the number one tendership for the world television title, if I remember rightly. Um, 1996. Now we're getting to the NWO years. Got to be Rey Mysterio vs. Psychosis from Bash at the Beach. What? That, was that the opener? I think it was the opener. And if it was, absolutely incredible opener, I mean. Just so innovative match for the time. It's kind of amazing that Rey Mysterio still have an awesome matches in 2019. Um, the 1997, I will go with... Obvious one. Eddie Guerrero, Rey Mysterio, Halloween Havoc, 1997. Probably the best cruiserweight match of all time, period, for me. Amazing match. One of those damn near perfect matches that you only get to see every now and then. 1998, you got to go with uh, Chris Benoit versus DDP versus Raven. Uh, False Count Anyway match at uh, Uncensored 1998. For, was that for, I think that was for the US title, I think. I'm pretty sure it was United States title match. I mean, this is the time Chris Benoit started to make a name for himself in WCW. DDP was really becoming an awesome wrestler. And Raven had a good run there as well. So awesome stuff. 1999. Got to go Chris Benoit versus Bret Hart. At Owen Hart tribute match. And Nitro in October. October the 5th I think it was. 1999. In the Kemper Arena. The arena where Owen Hart accident happened. Beautiful match. Absolutely just a beautiful wrestler match to be honest. So uh, just so emotional match that was. Then 2000, horrible, horrible year. But I'll very go with Goldberg versus Scott Steiner from Paul Brawl. That was an awesome match. Really, really good match. Uh, then 2001 for the three months WCW was alive in 2001. The match that stands out for me was on the last pay per view, Greed. That was um, Rey Mysterio and Billy Kidman versus Edith Skipper and Kid Romeo in the final of the WCW Cruiserweight Tag Team Title Tournament. I mean, does anyone, I bet no one even remembers Kid Romeo anymore. And unfortunately, Eric Skipper's kind of um, faded in history as well. But this is an awesome match. I've got about a four and a quarter star match. I think people will definitely have to check this match out. It's the, it stands out for me as the last great WCW match ever. So, nice. So, top ten match in wrestling history that you could go back to and change the outcomes of. So, I'm not going to go in any kind of order. I'm just going to... Name me 10 matches, so obviously, Shawn Michaels, British Bulldog, one night only, I mean, self-explanatory really, I'm English, you know the crap there, hated that finish, absolutely hated it, there's no excuse for me, I don't give a fuck what anyone says, British Bulldog had to win that match, Um, so, the number two, WrestleMania 30, Undertaker Brock Lesnar, Undertaker defeats Brock Lesnar, keeps the streak alive, yeah, I don't want to go into big details of kind of worms about this and talk about this too much, but yeah, the street should never have died. I'm sorry. Um, and it, uh, yeah, just, you know, I feel like Undertaker just should have won. Uh, Goldberg, SummerSlam 2003, should have won that Elimination Chamber to become the World Heavyweight Champion. Just always believed that. I mean, always believed that was um, 
that was Goldberg's time. And yeah, he won it at Unforgiven, but the fans were going so crazy during that Elimination Chamber. I feel like they would have lost a shit. And yeah, just think about the time Unforgiven rolled around, the fans had lost interest. And it just kind of summed up Goldberg's WWE run. Oh, fuck. So, Ultimate Warrior won the 1990 Royal Rumble, I think. A lot of people say, yeah, Mr. Perfect should have won the Royal Rumble instead of Hulk Hogan. And yeah, I can see that, but you think if Warrior was going to go on to win the title of WrestleMania 6, they should have went all out and had him win the Royal Rumble instead of Hogan. Could have been a uh, Warrior and Perfect the last two, and the Warrior winning that Royal Rumble, for me, anyway. Um, uh, Sting should have won at WrestleMania 31 there, I said it. I mean... Uh, I'm not, I'm not that pissed off about it now because it was, what, was four years ago, but bloody hell, man. Honestly, sorry, I'm not having that like at all. I still think Triple H, Sting should have beat Triple H at that WrestleMania, but whatever. Then, obviously, the, the big one, Daniel Bryan, should have won the 2014 Royal Rumble. Yeah. I mean, come on, I'm, I'm not getting arguments with people about this again. I mean, it was five years ago, It was, but whatever, I feel like... Um, Daniel Bryan should have won that rumble for absolute sure. Um, Kevin Owens should have beat John Cena at Money in the Bank 2015. I think that was one of the ones that pissed me off the most about Super Cena. I mean, I know we've had a lot of Super Cena moments in the past, but when, the fact he put Kevin Owens over originally, and then beat him two weeks later, and then decisively beat him after that. Ugh. I just feel like Kevin Owens could have gained so much from beating John Cena at that time when he did that. Um, one, I'll go with a couple of WCW ones, I think. This one I'm going to kind of cheat, but it's my q and I'll cheat if I want. Probably go with um, Sting and Hogan Starkin. Yes, Sting went over, but the, the whole bullshit of the... Ugh, the whole bullshit of the fake fast count and all that shit, the match restarting. So basically, Sting should have just beat up Hogan and won the title. Clean the middle, clean about any of these bullshit shenanigans and all that. I mean, I honestly do feel like um, I think that was definitely the first big mistake WCW ever made. I mean, I don't want to get into detail too much that now. But, and I'm not suggesting WCW, WCW died just because of this. I mean, there were many other reasons, but I, de- I this absolutely has to be a factor. I mean, it really does. It absolutely has to be a factor. I think Vader should have beat Hogan at Super Brawl 5 because he did a bullshit finish. I just feel like if uh, Hogan had lost to Vader and then chased Vader and then won the title back at Bash at the Beach, I just feel like there was a lot more money in that of um, Hogan initially losing to Vader and then Vader being the champion for a while then Hogan getting the belt back. But yeah, but that's... Of this history now, isn't it? There's no point in um, getting upset about things like that. So that that's nine. So I need one more. Uh, so Randy Orton WrestleMania 25. Randy Orton should have won that match at WrestleMania 25. Ah, I just can't feel like can't feel like his career was never quite the same after that. I mean, people might not realise how hot Randy Orton was at the time. I mean, Randy Orton was so hot going to that WrestleMania. And that feud of Triple H was actually really good. I mean, and then they had the match. They had an average wrestler match. And Triple H had beat Orton out of nowhere. It's just like, yeah, really? Yeah, it's really, really, really disappointing. Um, so, yeah, the next question, what have we got? Thoughts are behind the Titantron YouTube documentary. So, yeah, I think they're, they're actually outstanding, to be honest with you. I think, like, they're definitely some of the best wrestling-related videos on YouTube. Um, they're created by a channel called WrestleMania, which I'm sure most of you have probably heard of. But I'm pretty sure most people watching this video is probably familiar with the WrestleMania channel. Um, but if you haven't, if, I would say definitely check that channel out. It's an absolutely awesome channel. So just to explain what Behind the Titantron is. So basically it's a series of videos uh, documenting all the controversial things that's happened in wrestling history. So And he's got just about everything covered. So... Stuff like Owen Hart's accident, the Chris Benoit double murder suicide, the Montreal screw job, um, the whole rise and fall, death of the Von Erichs, all that sort of thing. 
got Eddie Guerrero's death. And then it's got like bad ideas such as so sort of like the WBF, the World Bodybuilding Federation, the XFL, and um, the heroes of wrestling pay per views covered, and um, the mass transit incident. It's all there. I mean, and I've got to give credit to the guy. Um, the guy who's done it has clearly does his research. I mean, he looks at it from all these different angles and has. I think he's had some. Um, Use some great uh, sources and all that sort of shit. So yeah, some some of them are very fascinating. I mean, lots lots of times I've watched these videos and found out things I didn't even know before. So yeah, I think definitely I think there's about thirty odd um, videos of them over the last couple of years. I mean, if you go into his channel, I think there's a playlist and you'll find them all. But they're definitely worth checking out. I definitely think they are probably some of the best wrestling related videos out there on YouTube. Um. Are there any one-time champions in the, any title in wrestling history that you would like to have a second reign with? Yes, yeah, some. But but I feel like the general rule is, normally, for the most part, if you only have the title once, it means you weren't a very good champion, so you don't get a second run. But there are a few, so... I feel like the one that's kind of crazy when you think about Goldberg, WCW champion. So you think of all the chaos in WCW in 99, 2000, all the title changes... You might be surprised to know Goldberg's actually only a one-time WCW champion. And that's the reign he had in 1998. I mean, yeah, he had the big gold belt again in WWE, but I don't really consider that the same title. Um, so I think it's kind of amazing that Goldberg never got a title back at any point in 99 or even 2000. I just think that's crazy to think about, really, when you think about it. I think a more modern one has to be The Miz. I mean, obviously The Miz had his WWE title reign in 2011. But wasn't wasn't one of the worst title reigns of all time or anything, don't get me wrong. But definitely wasn't a good title reign. But I feel like the work he did from like 2016 onwards, he definitely deserved another reign as champion. I mean, for me, for example, if he stayed on SmackDown, I would have much rather have seen him being the WWE champion than Jinder Mahal. I mean, let's be honest about that. Um, he even could have had the WWE title this year. I mean... If he'd have won the title over AJ Styles instead of Daniel Bryan, I don't think a lot of people would have complained. I think most people would have been all right with that. Um, so it would be a shame if the Miz's work never got him another run as a champion again. I mean, as far as other titles, kind of disappointing the British Bulldog never got the Intercontinental title back at any point. But he was only, only, only the Intercontinental champion once, and that was in 1982. And he only had the belt for like two months, so... You'd think at some point in 95, 96, 97, maybe he could have had another run with the belt. I mean, so it was kind of disappointing that he didn't do that. Um, I think Samoa Joe and TNA would have been nice if Samoa, if Samoa Joe could have got himself back into contention and had another run as TNA champion. For so his 2008 reign was kind of disappointing, so it would have been nice if he'd had a chance to redeem himself and have a second and more successful title reign, but... Who knows? I mean, it's just whatever, isn't it? I mean, would it be nice? Now, obviously, circumstances didn't work in their favour, but would be, would be great if Eddie Guerrero had another world title reign at WWE now? Obviously, he yeah, had this 2004 reign. The room in, innuendo has it that he was going to win the WWE title the weekend that he died, actually, because it was supposed to be Orton, Eddie Guerrero and Batista on that SmackDown, if you remember. And most people of the belief that Eddie was supposed to win the title back there. Who would, who but then obviously he died, so that fucked it up. It just would sad if Eddie Guerrero had lived and had another run as WWE champion. But yeah, so those are pretty much the main ones I can think of right now. I mean, there's probably more, but those are the ones I can really think of. During the British Bulldog and Owen Hart's tag title reign, 96, 1997, do you think they were still heels or were they still teasing and going babyface before? The in feuding and reuniting with Brett. I mean, they were clearly heels when they, when, when they were the tag team champions. When they beat the Smart and Guns, they had Clara and Mason as the manager. I mean, there's no doubt about that, that they were clearly heels there. Um, I feel like when they were teasing, splitting up and going to Brett, I mean, obviously how I interpret it is um, they were teasing the British Bulldog as a baby face and Owen as a heel, because you saw stuff like, Owen, wink, wink, accidentally eliminating the British Bulldog from the 97 Royal Rumble. Stuff like when the British Bulldog was flexing and Owen Hart would jump in front of him to try and steal the spotlight and all that. And obviously, the different thing about it was a British Bulldog who fired Clarence Mason as the manager. 
not um, Owen Hart. So it looked like before the whole reunite with Brest stuff happened, they were they were teasing it. Was, obviously, they were going to keep Owen as a heel and turn the British Bulldog babyface. But of course, once Brett turned heel, that all changed. So yeah, then we've got the last set of questions. <coughs> Omar Canute here. So what was your favourite wrestling video game? Answer this before, but answer it again, me. It's got to be Smackdown, Here Comes the Pain, because I've explained before. I never had an N64 growing up, so I missed out on all the Aki games. So, the WCW Revenge, WrestleMania 2000, WWF No Mercy, the N64, I missed out on them. And obviously, I don't, really, I don't play video, I don't play WWE video games now. I haven't played WWE video games for several years, but so in my growing up years, it was uh, the PS1, the early Smackdowns. But then before that, Attitude and Warzone, which admittedly, if I played that now, I'd probably hate them. So, but the best of which has to be Smackdown here comes up here. I mean, that's an iconic game for the PS2, came out in 2003. Yeah, I mean, cannot say enough good things about it. I mean, just everything about the game's awesome. The roster, the graphics, the gameplay, the game modes, the career modes, um, the use of Legends for the first time. Just so much good stuff to talk about on that. Smackdown here comes a play and then favourite pay to view, so I'm guessing of all time and gotta be yeah, WrestleMania 17, I mean easy answer for me. That's always gonna be my answer. I mean, awesome, awesome WrestleMania. Loved that show growing up, still holds up today. I mean, for me, the greatest WrestleMania of all time without question. Um greatest WWE pay to view of all time for me as well. I mean there's probably been some Wrestle Kings that have been better quote unquote wrestling shows, but I feel like just this year the sheer star power on this show, the variety on this show, because obviously you had um, Austin Rock, the main event, the great bra between Triple H and Undertaker, all the shenanigans with Vince and Shane, just car crash match with the TLC match, then a, a fantastic wrestler match with Kurt Angle and Chris Benoit, and it was pretty much obviously the end of the Monday Night War for me, this was a blow for the Attitude Era, I mean, I don't really want to debate that with people, but I feel like this was the official blot of the Attitude Era, that awesome era. And yeah, just all these years later, still such an iconic show. Then we got favourite tag team. So I'm guessing favourite tag team of all time. And um, Half Foundation. Massive Bret Hart fan. So it's obviously going to be the Half Foundation of Bret Hart, Jim the Anvil, Nighthard. One of the greatest tag teams of all time. Um, fair enough, saying, probably a close second, probably Edge and Christian. I just love those guys, I really do. I love the team, I love the characters that we had, um, the run on top they had, just great, great stuff. And then, <coughs> here's one. So, what do you think of this year's Rumble match? Well, I did review it, so you could just go back and watch me review, you know. So, um, so I, I, I'll briefly explain, but I'd rather you just went back and watched the review. Um, women's match I thought was good overall, but not great one. Um, I just feel like for the first 35 40 minutes it was pretty boring and lackluster, but it definitely did pick up towards the end. And of course, the last like 10 15 minutes or so was pretty awesome. Although, admittedly, going like I thought we had any business going like over 70 minutes, just didn't need to do that at all. Then the men's Warren Bull thought was a better of the two, but that was a much better pace overall. I mean, there was a lot of exciting action, and then of course, the right winner in Seth Rollins. And, Last question, which was a kind of well, I'll go back to it. Uh, should uh, Rousey versus Lynch go on last? Ah, no, that's a different question, actually, to be fair. So, R- Rousey versus Lynch go on last at WrestleMania or Lester Rollins? So, obviously, it's going to be Rousey, Lynch, and Charlotte now. But yeah, I put the women on last for me. That's For me, that's the biggest match of the WrestleMania this year that we've got. I think mean, that's going to be the most anticipated match of WrestleMania this year. But it's probably going to have the best build-up of this match at WrestleMania this year. And I feel like they've already started referring to it as a WrestleMania main event. In commentary and promos and things like that. So, yeah. And of course, obviously, you've got, you've got a great situation there. Put the women on last at WrestleMania. Give them the ultimate spotlight, I say. Definitely do it. So, for me, the women should go on last. And that's a wrap, guys. So, that's another Q&A session done. Uh, thanks for all the questions. And until next time, guys, peace.